So everyone should be able to see my screen now. And let me get to the PowerPoint slides, or the keynote slides. So what are we talking about this week? We're talking about everything associated with strings and lists. And that's kind of me repeating myself because a string is a list. It's just a special kind of list. And you can only do certain things with a string. Um, there's less freedom but more functionality, more functions that Python give you, gives you. And with a list, there is a lot of freedom in what you can do. So what is a string? A string is an ordered collection of characters surrounded by quotes. That's all it is. And a character can be a number, it can be a space, it can be a tab, it can be just about anything or, or the characters for a tab as long as it's surrounded by quotes. The other thing about a string is that it is immutable. And that means it can't be changed. Once you create a string, you cannot change that string. You can create another string from that string and have Python do the changes while it's doing the creation, but you can't actually change a string once you've created it. So here's just a, a, a quick example. If you have typed in this line of code, myster equals quote, this is a string, end quote, that's what you see. This is what Python sees. Python sees a variable name and a value. We talked about variables last week. And we talked about values last week. But the value here is really a series of individual characters. And this becomes apparent why in the next slide. Now, I'm going to uh, repeat myself a lot tonight. Meister is a variable. I know it is a variable because it is on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. The value on the right-hand side of the single equal sign is a string. I know it's a string because it is surrounded by quotes, surrounded by the same kind of quotes. So for, here's my thing about quotes. For every open quote, you have to have a closed quote of the same type. If you open with double quotes, you have to close with double quotes. If you open with single quotes, you have to close with single quotes. If they are not balanced and they are not the same kind, you're going to get a syntax error. So speaking of syntax errors, what is not a string? Well, what you're going to see in your script and what Python sees. So I have myster. Myster is a variable. It's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. I have the words, this is a string, which is what I had on the last slide. However, I'm missing something here. I'm missing a closing quote. And that will cause Python to have a syntax error when you're missing a closing quote. And sometimes it won't tell you. And, and we can look at this, and we'll look at this more as we go on in the class too. Python doesn't always tell you the exact line where the error occurred. It, it may tell you five lines later. It depends on when it makes the exact determination that it can't go on anymore because there was a problem. So for this one, there's a missing closing quote. This is another syntax error. Again, I have a variable called Meister, but I'm opening with a double quote and I'm closing with a single quote. You cannot do that. Python will give you an error. And again, it may give you an error five lines later. Okay, this is a string. Now, this is a syntax error, and you're saying, but wait a minute. You're opening with a, a, a double quote, and you're closing with a double quote. That's correct. However, there's a double quote in the middle of this string. And why in the world is that a problem? Well, because Python doesn't know where you're really closing it. It will say, I've opened a quote. A double quote, I said this is a space, close double quote, and then you've got this thing after it, string quote, and that's what it's going to see that's going to be the problem. So you have to have balance, which means you, it's, a, it's an even number. So if I open with one, I close with one. 
And you can't have, unless you do something special, you can't have a quote of the same type in a quoted string. So let's see how to fix it. So this is my, for every open quote, you have to have a closing quote of the same type. Like I said, I'm going to be repeating myself a bit tonight. So how do I correct those syntax errors? Well, we've got, you know, we've got our missing closing quote. Well, what do I, how do I correct it? I correct it by just simply adding a closing quote. I have my open quote, close quote that's a single quote. How do I correct this? I correct it by adding a double quote and removing the single quote. And then I have that quote in the middle. So I have an opening quote, quote, I have a double quote, and I have this stray double quote in the middle. What I do with that is I escape the double quote. The backslash says, ignore the fact, Python, that you would normally think that this quote is closing the string and just let it be a quote. Just let it look like a quote inside of the string because the quotes have special meaning. The quotes in Python say open left a quote a quote on the left side says I'm about to start a string. Quote on the right side says I've just closed my string. So if you want quotes of the same kind in the middle, you have to have a way to tell Python, hey Python Ignore this quote in the middle of the string as a closed quote. It's just a character. It has no special meaning to you. And you do that by escaping it. And you escape things with backslash. So why did I just go over these, these what's not a string and how to correct syntax errors? Because these are common things that I see students do in when they first start programming in Python are really a lot of different languages. Um, it's something very easy to miss. So if you're, if you're finding weird syntax errors, go back and look at your quotes. Okay, so there's my quote, my rule for quotes. And if you have a closing quote of the, the closing quote of the same type is inside a string, you have to escape it. That's the new one. Okay, so now we're going to look at the word ordered. What do I mean by an ordered collection of characters surrounded by a quote? Well, what I mean is that what I see in my, uh, in my code is a variable. I know Meister is a variable. So on the left-hand side, of a single equal sign. On the right-hand side, I have this value, and it's a string because it's surrounded by quotes. Python sees an individual selection of strings. Can I have everybody uh, mute, please? So what does ordered mean? Ordered means that for every single character, and character can include a space, it can include those characters that we can't see, there is a corresponding number. And that number tells you where it is in the string. Now, I'm sitting here and I'm reading, this is a string. I know exactly where the T is. But Python needs to know how you're going to access it. Because I have two I's. Which I do I want? I have T-H-I-S space I-S. So which I do I want? Well, I could tell it I want the second I, or the first I, which is at index 2. Uh, or the second I, which is at index 5, or the third I, which is at index 13. But those numbers keep the order. Now, there's a couple of things to notice here. First and foremost, every list, including a string, because a string is a list, begins with an index of 0. It does not begin with an index of 1. This is another thing that trips up new students quite quickly, okay? You think, well, it's the first character, so it's got to be an index of one. That's not how it works in Python or even Java at that point, or there's a lot of other languages where it's 
you, you start your index at zero. That's just the way it is. But again, this is something that can trip up students when they first start learning any language that starts with an index of zero. So every character in a string has a numerical placeholder, and it is called an index. So that's what we mean by ordered. It has an index value associated with it that keeps the order. OK, so now I'm going to flip over to lists. We have to understand lists before we can understand strings. Now, the difference between a list and a string is that lists are mutable, which means they can be changed. Now, we're going to go over this more in five, in module five. But we want to introduce these concepts right now, and Zybooks introduces them, so I'll talk about them. Once I'm done talking about this slide, we're going to go look at, some of, at one of the challenges. So what do I see in my script? Well, I see a variable called my list. I know it's a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. But now I have this new stuff. On the right-hand side, I've got a, a, a left square bracket and a right square bracket, and I've got things divided by commas. Well, what in the world is this? This is, in fact, a list. And this is the syntax to create a list. So what does Python see? Python sees a variable named my list. And for the values, it sees three separate values with indexes. And the syntax is open square bracket. I have an element doesn't matter what the element is. It could be another list. It could be a string like the word Lisa. It could be 42. It could be 3.14, which is a float. So I can mix and match the types of my elements. Each element in a list is separated by a comma. Has to be. That's just the way it is. And when I'm all done with my, my list, I close with a, uh, a closing square bracket or a right square bracket. So this is the syntax of a list, and that's what you do in Python. You are creating a list of elements. Now, is Lisa really a string? Yes. And is that string a, a list? Yes. But it can also be, in and of itself, an element within a list. So let's go take a break, and we're going to go to challenge 2.12. I've got a couple questions. Okay, so I hope everyone is doing well. Okay, that was very nice, Stephen. Okay, so if we go to, what was that, 221. All right, let me make this bigger so everybody can see it. Not quite that big. Okay, so I have... Challenge 2.21, and I have short names equal Gus, Bob, and Zoe. And then I'm going to print short name of zero. So let's go and edit the configuration. And where am I? Okay. 2.21. Oh, where did it go? Oh, there we are. I think so. 2.21, 2.23, 2, 2.4. Where's my 2.21? 2.12. No, 2.21. Sorry about that. Let's take a look. 2.21. Where did I put that? Okay, so here's one of the things I wanted to show you about PyCharm. I was going to do it later, but I'm going to do it now. You guys have to turn in a .py file this week, okay? You're going to write your first script that's going to take in your age, and it's going to calculate something, and it's going to print out something. So how do you figure out where that script is? Well, how you figure it out is each of your scripts will have their own little tab up here. So if I right-click, or 
And now I'm on a Mac, so it won't be exactly the same, but if I go to Reveal in Finder, and I think yours is going to be like Open in Folder, it will show me where that is, okay? So here it's under my Module 2, and it's 2.2.1. So that is how you figure out where Python has stored your script. The other thing is you don't have to save a script. Python automatically writes it to disk. There's no save button. So let me go find this again, because I am in the right place, module two, two point two one. There we go. So I'm going to run this. I'm going to put it in the debugger, because we know I like the debugger. And what do I have? Well, I'm stopped on line number three. Didn't stop on line number one, because it's a comment. Stop on line number three. I'm going to look at my variables. And right now I have nothing. When I step over, I now have a short names variable. PyCharm tells me it's a list. And it has three elements in the list. So if I step over line five, it's going to print out Gus. OK. Not very exciting. So let's let's make a few changes and let's see what errors we can get into. Let's do a little mischief. So first of all, I'm just going to create some syntax errors. OK, all I did was take away that closing right bracket. And you'll see I have big red marks. And if I go to run this, I have, now this is one of these, these things where I'm, I said, it, Python might not tell you exactly where the problem is. And this is one of those instances. This problem is on line three. There's no doubt about it. Python is saying, hey, wait a minute. There's invalid syntax on line five. I'm looking at line five. Line five looks just fine. Line three is where the problem is. Python did not realize there was a problem until it got to the P on line five, until it got to the word print. So this is one of the things you have to be careful. Um, programmers write programming languages, and we're notoriously bad at writing error messages. Um, now, there are reasons sometimes where you have trouble, where, where a programming language will have trouble determining where the end of something is. But as programmers that are using the language, these are pitfalls that we have to be wary of. So if the only thing I do is add back that closing bracket, and I run this, and I have Gus. Oh, that's perfect. So let's do something else. Let us try and, yeah. So we know that this is 0, 1, and 2. So let me just do this. Let me copy that, and I'm going to say 1 and two, and this is pretty predictable because we will print out Gus, Bob, and Zoe. Okay? But what happens if I forget about that whole start with zero thing? And I say three. Because there are three elements in the list. That would make sense, except we've got that whole start with zero, zero thing. So if I do that, I'm going to get an error down here, and it's going to say index out of range. An index out of range means that I've basically walked off the end of the list. I have three elements here, but when I tell it that I want to go to, to the third, what I think might be the third place, all of a sudden there's nothing there, and that's because of that whole start with zero. There may be three elements in the list, but you can only go to index two because the first element is zero. So those are just some things to watch out for, some things to understand if you start to see these error messages. So let's go back and talk about CRUD. We're going to talk about CRUD a couple of times in this class. Um, we're going to talk about it here. We're going to talk about when we do lists and dictionaries. CRUD is basic principles. Um, a lot of people hear it for the first time when they're doing databases. 
but it's the concept that you can do four things. Okay, with a list and a string, you can do four things. You can create it, you can read it, you can update it, and you can delete it. Those are the only four things you can do. You may have different ways to do them, but there are only four things. And if you can remember that, when you're sitting down at your program and you're thinking about, oh goodness, what do I have to do here? Well, I have to create it. Do I need to read from it? Do I need to modify it, which is update? Do I need to get rid of it altogether? So if you can remember those four things, it helps you understand what you're doing at any point in a program, especially when it comes to lists and dictionaries. And now it comes to strings. So let's talk a little bit about creating a list. We saw before that I created a list with stuff inside of it. Well, you don't have to. You can create what they call an empty list. The empty list is a left square bracket and a right square bracket with absolutely nothing in between. So I have a variable. The name of my variable is empty list. I know it's a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. On the right-hand side is a left square bracket and a right square bracket, and that means I have an empty list. Sometimes I just need to create an empty list and then populate it later. As we saw on the last slide, I can create a populated list by putting elements in the middle and, um, uh, and commas in between them. I can get at information in a list. So I've got my list. It's got Lisa 42 and 3.14. And they are in indexes 0, 1, and 2. So if I want to print the first element in the list, I say my list of 0 is Lisa. And if I want to print my list of 2, it's 3.14. We saw this in the last thing, but it's always good to repeat sometimes when new concepts are coming up. So updating. I can... With a list, I can modify it. With a string, I can't. So what do I do here? Well, I have my list, and I'm going to change the first element in the list to 25. And what that does, because 42 was the, per, uh, sorry, the element at index 1 is going to be changed to 25. The element at index 1 was originally 42, and I basically pull out the value 42, and put in the value 25. Now it's important to know here that the types don't have to be the same. I could have replaced it with a string or a float or a boolean. Um, Python is not a um, strictly typed or heavily typed language, so I can mess around with types a lot. Okay, so I want to now add something to the end of my list. I'm going to add the word add, and all it's going to do is just plunk something onto the end of the list. Delete. I can delete an element from the list. And in this case, I'm going to delete Lisa from the list. And what happens when I delete that is not that it just deletes the element, but it renumbers. So if I delete the first element in the list, it's going to renumber starting at zero. If I delete the middle element in the list, it's going to renumber. So this is what I have in my list, and if I want to remove the word add, I can just do a remove, and it will simply remove that last element from the list, and I can also delete an entire list. Okay, so we're going to look at, this one is not a challenge, this one is crud.py, and this just has what you saw in there. Um, and it's just so that you guys can go through and look at the code as it happens. And we'll run through this really quick, just so you can see what it looks like in PyCharm as a running script. So let's go to CRUD. And I'll make this a little bigger. I'll make this a little bigger. Why is that not doing that? OK. So I'm going to create an empty list. Let's just de step it through the debugger. I create an empty list if I go and look at my variables. I have an empty list. You will see that there is nothing in the list because 
that's a zero. I can create a populated list. I can print out the elements in the list. So we'll see my list of zero is Lisa. Now, one thing I'm doing here, okay, is you'll notice that the second element in the list was the integer 42. I converted it to a string by using the stir method. Okay, so if I'm concatenating string, strings with the plus sign, I have to remember that floats and integers and booleans need to be converted to a string or I'll get an error message and I'll show you what that error message is in just a minute. So I have printed out the three things in the list. I have now changed the first element. So let's go back here. My list now got changed to 25. I should have showed you that before I stepped over it. I'm going to print my list, which is Lisa 25 and 3.14. I'm going to append add to the list. And now I have four elements in the list. And the last thing is add. I'm going to delete the first element in the list. And lo and behold, Lisa goes away. I'm going to print that list. And I'm going to finally print the last one. So let's do a little... Uh, let me show you another common error. Now, my list has the number 42 as the second element, or the element at index 1. If I don't convert it to a string, and I run this, I get a can only concatenate stir, not int to stir. That is because this is an integer. And if I don't explicitly tell Python to make it act like a string, then Python's going to give me an error. And that's what the stir function does. It tells Python, hey, I know it's not a string, but look up, um, but treat it for just this time as a string. So how are we doing? We got any questions? OK. Um, let's keep going. All right, why do we talk about list? Because a string is just a list that can't be modified. Um, and, and it's important to understand the basics of a list before we get more heavily into strings. So what do I want to do if I want to change strings? Well, Python gives us a way to, to create a string from an existing string and make the modification while it's creating it. So we can't make the modification, but Python can. Um, so does CRUD really apply? Well, kind of, OK? You can create and read just like you do any other list, OK? You can delete the entire string. And you can update by creating a new string from the old string plus a modification. So let's take a look at that. All right, crud with a string. So I am going to create something called my empty stir. My empty stir is a variable. You know it's a, a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. On the right-hand side is just two quotes. That's all it is. So there is nothing inside that string. Um, and and I may just want to create that because I want a placeholder and I want to remind myself that it's a string. But you can do it. The other way is to create a populated string. We've seen that in several other slides. You have characters between two matching quotes, and you have a string. So I can read from a string just like I can read from a list. If I want to print an element in the string, I can simply call it by its index number, because that's what I do. I say my stir open. 0, open, sorry, open left square bracket, the index, close square bracket. Okay, I can also do that for 10, and that's going to give me an S. I can read and create. Now, this is something called slicing, and slicing is really, really handy when you're dealing with strings. Slicing is a specific notation that Python allows you to do 
where you can actually take a portion of the string and create a new string from it. So I have a variable called my newster. My newster, I know it's a variable, it's on the left hand side of a single equal sign. And I will stop saying that next week. Um, I have the value myster. And myster, has, this is a string, and it starts at 0 and it ends at 15. And I only want to get the values, the characters, at 10, 11, and 12. And you're going to say, wait a minute, but you put a 13 there. Yes, I did. 13 is not inclusive. The end index is not. It's another weird thing about Python, but it has to do with the fact that we start at zero. So this is a specific notation. You can slice things out. You can pull it out, and you're going to get str. Um, so you can create a new string from an existing string using slicing. Um, the start index is inclusive. The end index is not inclusive. It's something that people forget when they first start using that. It, again, is one of those things that can be a little irritating. Um, and we can look at what happens um, if you don't do that right. Okay, so let's look at a little bit more about string slicing. And I talk about this some because you're probably going to have to use it this week. So there's two shortcuts. The first one is that you don't have to use the um, an end index. If you just want it to go all the way to the end, if you want to start, in this case, at index number 8 and go to the end, then you don't have to worry about putting 15 or 16 because it's not inclusive. So what do you do here? Well, what you do is you just leave that end index off, and Python automatically knows to start at 8 and then go to the end, however long the end is. You can also do the opposite. You can start at the beginning and go to the 1 minus the index number that you give it. So you can go four spaces over, or in this case, to the third index element. So it would be T-H-I-S. Um, so let's look. A simple string? Yep. Oh, goodness. All right, let me go back and look at this. Hope I didn't miss too much. Okay. Wait a minute. I'm missing something here. Okay. No space required. Okay, sorry, I'm missing something. Here we go. There we go. Okay. Yes, you could replace a plus with a comma, but I think you still have to. Um, now, I guess with a comma, you don't. Um, what is the purpose of an empty list? Well, when we start to get into loops, it isn't. Sometimes you're going to have to create um, a variable that's accessible inside and outside the loop. But you won't have anything to put in it because you're going to populate it inside the loop. And we're going to talk a little bit more about scope, but oftentimes you create empty variables when you need to use them in multiple scopes. So you create it in the outer, in the, in the outer scope, and then you can use it in both the inner scope and the outer scope. And that may not make a lot of sense, but there are very valid use cases for why you would do that. Very good, Stephen. Yep, a loop. Um, yes. So is that a space before the end bracket? If so, you leave the number blank. Yeah, and you don't need to have a space after that colon. You just need to have like eight colon. Um, and you just already answered that, Stephen. Thank you. Um, yeah, and that's a very good, uh, Harold, that's a very, very good recommendation. Don't be afraid to try things. You're not going to, the house is not going to fall down around you if you get a syntax error. So play with it. Try it. Try something else. Oftentimes what I tell new students or even intern programmers when we get them in is um, 
Try something out. If it doesn't work, comment that line out, copy it, and try something else. You may have a, a script with massive amounts of commented lines, but you will always see what you've tried before so you don't get lost. So trying is a very good thing, and there are, there are kind of systematic and orderly ways you can try to learn things with that. Okay. So simple string. Let's see what that has in it. Actually, I'm going to do simple split. Here's a lot of splits. Uh, oh, wait a minute. No, I wanted slice. Is this slice? That doesn't slice. I'm sorry. Oh, here we go. All right. So simple string, we're doing some slicing. Okay. Uh, simple string. Okay. So here's simple string. And basically, I have this is a string. I'm going to print it out. I'm going to print out the first element, and then I'm going to slice it. And um, I'm going to slice it a couple different ways. You will always, always remember when you're slicing something, you are going to, the result is going to be another string. So you got to put it someplace. So if you're slicing, you need to have that on the right-hand side of a single equal sign with a variable on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. So let's step through this really quick. And I'm going to go to the console. I've got Meister. Now if I go look at variables, I see that I have this as a string. And if I step over this, you will see that I create something called stir. And by the way, these again are going to be with the, in the description of the YouTube video, so you can download them and use them as you need. Um, so I've now done, I've got my new stir again, which is going to have a string. I'm going to do it again with this. Now I'm going to do a find here, and actually I'm going to stop because we're going to go to these in the next slide. So we've done all these. Uh, hold on. Let's go down to the next one. OK, so we have some string methods. So Python puts a lot of restrictions on what we can do on strings. But then it gives us some functions to help out. So if I want to, and these are important to know, <laughs> because you'll probably have to use them in a lab. If I want to find the index of the first occurrence of a character, I use the find function. So find just says, tell me where the S starts. Tell me where the first S is. Or maybe it says, tell me where the colon is. Or maybe it says, tell me where the slash is. It can tell you where anything is. Maybe you're saying, tell me where that period is so I know when I am splitting my thing because I have sentences. There's all kinds of reasons to use find. And that's what it does. It, it gives us back an index, and you can now have maybe a starting place or an ending place. If I want to replace a portion of a string, I can have a new string and replace, use the replace function. So I'm not having to slice, I'm just saying, any occurrence of the word this now becomes the word that. And I'm going to put the result of that change into a string. And then I can also count the occurrences of a character in my string. And in this case, I have three. And it's important to understand count because you're going to have to use that in a lab. But also, if you want to find out more about what Python does with strings, you can go to the Python documentation. So I can go to docs.python.org. And for, for my class, I have no problems with anyone doing this. Google is my friend in programming, and I believe it should be yours. You can go out here and you can look at all of the things that you can do to a string. Python gives you all of it. It gives you examples. 
And if this isn't clear enough, you can also go to W3 schools. Yeah. So let's take a quick look, and we're going to continue now going to this. So I have find, I have replace. So I'm just going to keep stepping over. I'm going to find S. Now, the find returns a number. It returns an integer. So in this case, it returns 3. Replace returns a new string. So there's a difference there. And then count returns an integer. Okay. And also there's the length function. If I want to know how long my string is or how long any list is, I use the len function. And I have then open parenthesis, close parenthesis, and in the middle it's the string or the list. So that's what we do for that. So splitting and joining. This is where strings and um, lists comes together. Okay? So you can split a string into a list and you can join a list into a, a, a string. Sorry. So if I have a string called Meister, and I have the first, I have the word first and the word second, in a string with a comma separated in the middle, I can go and tell Python, hey, wait a minute, I know that there's a comma in the middle of every element in this string, and every time you hit a comma, I want you to actually create a new element in a list. So that's what happens. If I split it, I get a list with two elements, because I have only two elements in my string, or only one comma. And I'm going to have first and second. And it's going to be a list, and I can treat it like a list, which means I can modify it. So if Let's say I want I have a space delimited sp uh, string, and I want to modify it in ways that I can't do with a string. I can turn it into a list. I can modify the list. I can turn it back into a string, and I can do that by joining. Joining turns a list into a string. So I have first and second. Now, this notation is a little bit odd. Um, and basically what it is, is it's saying, I want to join my list, but you have to have a string to join to. So if you're having a list and you don't have a, a previous string, you just put double quotes, because join has to act on a string. It, it doesn't exist um, kind of on its own. It, can only exist with a string object. So that's what you do. You join a, a list to make it a string, and you split a string into a list. And so we can go look at simple split. Uh, let's see. I don't understand the question, Harold. Is it quote, comma, quote, or quote, comma, space, quote? Oh, okay, so if you're splitting and there's a space, Python takes care of that space for you. If you're splitting on a comma and you've got comma space, Python's going to, gonna, uh, I believe, it's going to get rid of that space. But let's give it a try. And, and I will answer that definitively. Okay, so we're going to have our simple split. Okay, simple split. Okay, here's our simple split. And I've got first comma second, and I'm going to split here. And I've got a space here, so let's see what happens. So I'm going to debug. I've got my first comma second. Now I'm going to do the split. So on this split, I'm going to create a list, okay? And it did not get rid of the space. So what do I do to get rid of a space? Well, I can actually remove a space. I think it's trim in Python. I can trim the space. In fact, let's look at that. 
So, if I want to remove the beginning straight, it's not trim. Trim is at the end. I can strip it. So, that's a good function to remember. And this is a good way to look up the function. I could have also gone here and... Look, strip isn't there. Okay. I'd have to go figure out which Python doc it is in. Um... So that answers your question, Harold. It does not remove the beginning space. You have to strip it. So we can just go over this, and this is basically what we saw. So when I create the new string, when I join it, there is a space there because it had left the space before. Now, if I had stripped that, then what I would have had to do is I would have had to add the space back if I wanted it. So I have split it. I'm joining it now. I did that twice. I shouldn't have. Um, now I'm going to split differently. Now I'm going to split on a dash because it doesn't just have to be a comma. It can be any character. So let's say I have a social security number and I want to split it out into its three parts. Well, I can do that by splitting, but the split has a dash. So I now have a list called parts, and it has, in fact, the parts of the social security number. And I can also now, this is different, I can say separator equal um, dash, and I can then use that separator to join the parts of the list. So before, I just had quotes. And so it just kind of acted on the fact that there was nothing. But if I have this dash or any other character, and I want to join the list on that character, and I called it separator for a reason, what will happen is Joinster will actually have that dash in between each of the elements in the list. So this is another way you can build a string very quickly if you, ha if you know what your separator is, if you know that the phone number is going to have dashes, or if you know that your comma delimited file is always going to have commas. This is a way you can join it very, very quickly. Um, and then here I'm just going to print parts. And I'm using the format function, which we haven't gotten to yet. But we will. So I have the length of parts. I have the different parts. And I just joined them again. Okay. So let's go back. And string formatting. Okay, there's a format function, and this is my favorite way of formatting a string. The format function allows you to, um, it's parameterized formatting. I can take a variable, and I can, based on its position in the format argument list, I can create a very complex string very easily. I don't have to worry about pluses in the, in the string. I don't have to worry about um, where my spaces are, because I can see all of that. What I have here is I have a print statement, and inside that print statement, I'm using the format function to actually place my variables. So let's take a look. This is my example, and you have to have the same number of placeholders as you have variables. I have print now, but format can work on any string, and it doesn't have to work inside of a print statement. A placeholder is a left curly brace followed by a right curly brace. And that indicates that you're going to use, you're either going to print that out as it is, or if there's a format function, you're going to take a value from a variable and put it in place of those squiggly braces. And in two, two of those places, I just have normal placeholders. But there's this other placeholder here. And this allows me to apply a format based on the type. 
So I have a float, and that float, I only want to print two decimal places after that float. So what am I going to do? I'm going to use a special notation that begins with a colon, dot two, only two decimal places after, only two numbers after the decimal place, and I'm expecting a float. And that's why you have the little F there. So let's look at the example. Okay, I have num, which is 42, pi is 3.14, meister is pi day. So I have num1 is going to go to the first place, float is going to go to the second place, and meister is going to go to the third place. It is positional. Okay, 1, 2, 3. So num is the first argument, float is the, float 1 is the second argument, and meister is the third argument. And so it will print out like that. Now there's a gotcha here. And the gotcha is if you have a specific formatter for a specific type, you need to make sure that that type is in the right order to go to that formatter. So I have an example too, exact same thing, num1, pi1, meister. I'm going to have the same print statement. Now the only thing that has changed here is the order. So I have, oh my arrow was wrong, sorry. I'll fix that. Um, this should have been my stir, so my stir is the second in the list now. And if I take a string and I put it into colon dot two f, Python is going to give me an error, and it's going to give me an error because my stir is in float, and it won't work. So let's go look at challenge two point one seven. Uh, sorry, two seven one. And this is just a simple format one. And this is, sorry, this is from challenge 2.71. And I can put in anything that I want. Uh, let's edit the configuration. 271. And I'm going to run it. And I'm going to start by putting in a word. And it's just going to be uh, Python. And then I'm going to put in a number, and I'm going to make that 42, and it's going to say Python comma 42. That's all you're getting there. Now, if I did something a little different, and I also said user float, and I input a float, let's see what would happen. So I'm going to copy this. And I'm going to, now I'm going to use that format specifier. And I'm going to take that format specifier and I'm going to say colon point to F. And I'm going to add, well first I'm not going to add anything there because it's going to cause an error. If I don't have three arguments at this point, let me comment this guy out. So let me just run it like this. Now the only thing I've done here is I've added this float. And I've added this open curly brackets, close curly brackets, um, colon point two F. Yes. P format is a, a function in Python 3. If you're using Python 2, you're going to have problems with this because it was introduced in Python, Python 3. Um, so let me run this. And I'm going to input Python. And I'm going to input 42, and I'm going to input 3.14. So I just got an error. The error that I got is replacement index to out of range for precision args tuple. That makes a whole lot of sense, doesn't it? So let's take let's let's get rid of position, positional args tuple and go back to the beginning. So it says replacement index to out of range. Well, if I look at this, and I'm still thinking one, two, three, I'm like, well, no, there's something there. And why it's telling me this is it's saying I have two arguments in the format function, but you're telling me to expect three. I have one set of open curly braces, a second set of open curly braces, and a third set of open curly braces. So I'm telling it to expect three, but I'm only giving it two. So I have to give it the same number of 
variables that I'm telling it to expect. Without that, it won't work. So now I'm going to do user float here. And we'll see if everything's fine. So we're going to type in Python. We're going to type in 42. We're going to type in 3.14. Okay? And I get Python 42 and 3.14. Now let's change this around a bit. Let me do this. Actually, I'm going to just copy and paste and comment this out because that was the working one. So now I'm going to just change this a bit. I'm going to take user number out of here and I'm going to put a comma and do that there. And I'm just going to run it again. I'm going to put the exact same things in Python 42 and 3.14. And I get this odd thing of Python 3.14 and 42.00. So Python was smart enough to say, well, you don't actually have a float, but it's still a numeric type, so I'm not going to crash. Now let's do this. And actually, I'm going to, let's do this. And see what happens. I'm going to go here, and I'm going to put the word in last. Python 42. 3.14. And now I get my error. Unknown format code F for object of type stir. User word is not a numeric type. It's not an integer or a float. And because of that, and because I'm telling it that it's the third variable to put in, Python can't do it because of that formatter. Um, so let me comment this out before I forget. Put that one back there so when I upload it, it'll upload better. Okay, so now we're going to start going through the labs. I know we're at 10 o'clock. Um, so lab 2.12. Now one thing you will notice when you look at the upload is that I give you the solution for lab 2.12. And that is because, uh, and I've checked this out with school, so this is legal. Um, we barely give you enough information about decisions, about if statements, to actually do this lab. We don't actually get into branching until 3, so they do this really quick thing in Zybooks to say, oh, and by the way, here's how you do this if thing, and then expect you to get it for a lab. And that, to me, is unfair. And so the only time in this class you will get a solution from me is for lab 2.12. So that will be part of the upload. Um, and like I said, I've checked this out with the school. I checked it out a couple when I first saw this. And so um, just know that it's there. Go ahead and try and do it on your own if you want. That's completely fine. If you're frustrated, the solution is there. So what are we asking you to do? So what we're asking you to do is we're asking you to take in three words, first name, middle name, and last name. If you have first name, middle name, and last name, then you're going to print last name, comma, first initial, dot, middle initial. If somebody only input two words, then you're just going to have last name, comma, first initial. And it's that difference that's the problem. It's that if. So here is the... Uh, flow chart for that. And basically what you're going to do is you're going to start, you're going to declare a name, you're going to input the last name, the first name, and the middle name. Uh, you're going to declare last name. That's not my, that's not right. My bad. You're going to split the name into a list using a space delimiter. So this is where split comes in. Now here's the thing that we haven't done yet that we don't really get into in depth until next week. If length of name list is greater than two, if it's greater than two, sorry, if it's not greater than two, then we're going to out do the output and we're going to end. If it is greater than two, then we're going to do a different output and we're going to end. So lab 2.13, I do not give you the solution for this. You guys get to do that on your own. Um, you're going to input a string which contains a character and a phrase 
and whose output indicates the number of times the character appears in the phrase. So this is where we have to use that count. This is also where we might have to do a split into a list. So let's take a look. So we're going to start, as always. We're going to declare Meister. We're going to input Meister. We're going to declare my list. We're going to now split my list Meister into a list. We're going to declare the character count variable. We're then going, oops, sorry, don't know why I did it in that order. All right, we're going to go back. Here, let me just show it to you. So we're going to set the care count to the character count. This is in section 2.10 and you're going to count, use that count function, and the split is in section 2.11. So that's where you want to use the split. Okay, 2.14 has three sections. Basically what you're going to do is you're going to take in some variables, and you're going to use those variables to develop passwords. So you're going to take in three different variables, two words and a number, and you're going to... Um, output two passwords, and then you're going to output the length of each password, which is the number of characters, which is that len function. Um, so here is the flowchart. You're going to declare three words, two words and a number. You're going to input two words and a number. You're going to declare your password, password one and password two. You're going to set password one to the concatenation of number, word one, and number. You're going to set password two to the concatenation of word one, underscore, and word two. And this is where that format function comes in very, very handy. And then you're going to output them, including the length, and that is the len function. So that's what we've done. Um, you have a nice evening, Dylan. Um, I thank you, Stephen, for putting up that. Yes, I do record my lectures if at least one student shows up. But let me remind you, if you're the only student that shows up, I have been known in the past to not record it and to just do a tutoring session for that student if they have any issues. So don't expect anyone, to, you know, if nobody shows up, I won't do a lecture. If one person shows up, I may just make it a private tutoring session. So you guys take that and do what you need. Um, I will be uploading to my YouTube channel most likely tomorrow. I try and have them up on Fridays. Um, so if anybody has any questions, if you want to open the mics and ask any questions, you're more than welcome to. If not, have a good evening. I'm glad you liked the lecture, Harold. Thank you for uh, monitoring the chat and answering some of those questions. I appreciate it. So Hi, I'm gonna I had a question. Ed. Okay. It, it, I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't understand the understand format the function, function um, all that much. that much. Okay. So format is just an easier way of doing things. So um, format is positional. Let me close this down. Format is positional. So format is a function that is provided by Python. And it basically allows you to um, just simply replace um, a certain character set with a, with a string, a number, or float, or boolean. So, the way this works, and I don't even have to do it in a print function, and I think that some people get confused because they always see it in a print function, but really format works on a string. So if I create a string and say um, test format with uh, let's see um, dot to f and then I do dot format user word user number whoops user float oh, 
Yes. I prefer to use format. Format is kind of my favorite way of doing it because I think it makes it more explicit. So easier is flavor. There is function and there is flavor. And you find the flavor that works for you. As long as you understand the functionality, you do it however you want. For my students in my class, you want to do it in a given way that makes the most sense to you, you do that. I can't tell you how another professors are going to grade. My purpose is as long as I know that you understand what it is you're doing, I'm okay if you do it differently than I do. So here is just a string. So I'm going to say formatted stir. So what am I doing here? I am taking user word and I'm replacing those two characters. And I'm taking user number and I'm replacing the second set of those characters. And I'm replacing user float and I'm replacing the third set of those characters, but the third set of those characters have what's called a format specifier, which will change potentially how the output looks. It won't change the value of the variable. It will change how the output looks. So Let's, and then I'm going to so I'm going to stop here. I'm going to debug it. Um, hold on, let me stop. I'm going to debug it. There we go. And my word is going to be Python. I know, I'm boring. My number's going to be 42, and I know I'm old, but that comes from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And now I'm going to put in a longer float so we can actually see what the specifier does. One, four, one, I can't remember. Five, two. I know that's not the right thing for pi. This appears to correspond closely to the print. Yes, it does. It definitely does correspond closely to that, Harold. That's exactly right. Um, so I've now put in these three things. And did I hit enter for the last one? There we are. So now I'm at formatted stir. So we see user word is Python, user number is 42, and user float is 3.14152. And that's not right for Python. But it's after 10 or for Pi. Um, after 10 o'clock and my brain shuts down. So what's going to happen here is you can actually draw a line. User word is going to be, it's going to replace those two things. Now this is something that is very specific to the format function. And that open and close curly brace is special to the format function. Okay, the format function goes out and does a replace. Just like you would, we were talking about string replace. This is a string replace. Okay, format goes out and says, okay, find me the open curly brace and the closed curly brace and see if there's anything in between. There's nothing in between to a direct replacement. If there is something in between, then maybe you want to change it before you do the replacement. And then it's going to create a new string, and that new string is going to be put into my formatted stir. So it literally is user word is one. This is the first open and close curly braces. User num is two. This is the second open and close curly braces. And user float is three. And this is the third open and close curly braces. So if I step over this line, my stir is going to be test format with Python 42 and 3.14. You'll notice that I put in 3.14152 and this dot two colon dot two f basically says only show two decimal places. Um, and then I can print it out. So that's what happens under line. Now, what I mean by positional is that, yes. Okay.
Okay, I'm glad you will be here every week. Yes, Monday is Pi Day. You are very, very correct. Um, so let me. So this is positional. Sorry, I just checked the chat. This is positional, which means if I swap like user word for user number, then the the order in which they show up in the string is going to change. So I'm going to change this to user number, and I'm going to change this to user word. And I'm just going to run it. Okay, so I got Python, I got 42, and I got 3.14152. Again, it's wrong. So I now have test format with 42 Python and 3.14. I didn't change this. I only changed the order that I put the variables. Now another thing I can do here is I can just use user number three times if I want. So if I run this again, the only thing I've done, you'll notice, is I have taken user number and just put it in there three times because I can. So if I run this, again, I'm going to type Python. I'm going to type 42, and I'm going to type 3.1452, and I know it's wrong. And now I get test format with 42, 42, and 42.00 because it's positional. And I can create an error by simply doing this, by saying number, number, and word. Because Python can't automatically convert a word to a float or an integer. You have to do it. Um, and in this case, it wouldn't work anyway, because I'm actually putting in a word. So here, if I go Python, and I go 42, 3.14. And I get that traceback error. And I get that error because format it, because this is saying look for a very specific variable type. And it's not. A string is not that specific variable type. So does that answer your question about format? Does that help you understand it a little bit better? Yeah, definitely. It sure does. I appreciate it. Oh, not a problem. That's what I'm here for. Um, does anybody else have any questions? Uh, yes, please. Uh, I'm sorry. Are the classes only on Thursday night? I only lecture on Thursday night. I believe... Um, Professor Ling will sometimes lecture on Tuesdays, but I haven't seen his announcement. Okay. So I can't tell you if it's still on Tuesdays, but I lecture on Thursday nights and then I record them. Okay. Um, no problem. So, Ryan, in your third open and close, close squiggly braces, why do you not specify the variable at the beginning of the format? Because that's just... Um, not generally the way I do it, and that's not the way PyCharm teaches it. I don't even know if that's valid syntax. Let's try it. Let's see if that's valid syntax. Let's just try this. So let's just say, let's see what happens. If I say user underscore what do we think is going to happen? Do we think that it's going to actually replace user float with that? And in fact, I will put user number here and see. So let's see what happens because I think what it's going to do is it's going to print out user float. Maybe, maybe not. Let's go and see what happens. So I'm going to run this and I'm going to put Python and I'm going to say 42 and I'm going to say 3.1 to whatever, and I get user float. So this is causing a different kind of issue. 
because format is looking for specific things in a string, remember it's pulling, it's going to pull out these things in the squiggly brace and anything in between them. Interpret that into what it needs to do and then replace that part in the string. It doesn't know what to do with the word user float here. So it's not a correct command because essentially I'm sending in a command to the format function. And user float is not a correct command. It doesn't know what user float is. It knows what colon.2f is, but not what user float is. So that would not be correct syntax. And so I would get that runtime error. Does that make sense? Um, okay. I don't know why Zybooks returns it with a key error, but it is still, in fact, an error. Um, so I'm sorry if Python is making this confusing for you. Um, and Joel, you're not going early. Um, I tend to try and get this done by 10 o'clock, and it doesn't seem to work lately. Um, yes. Um, yes, that's correct, Ryan. Oh, uh, the Zybooks you get to from the module in Brightspace. There is no separate last in the previous uh, previous terms. There was a separate Zybooks link. There is no sep um, separate Zybooks link. You will go into the module, and you should be able to click Zybooks in the module or in the general instructions, and it will take you to Zybooks. So you do it through Brightspace. Um, there are a couple of resources. First of all, there are tutoring. Skylar, there are tutoring services, and I think that you get like so many hours free. So you can check with your advisor about that. Um, and I've heard good things about the tutors. I've had students who've used them every term, and they have been helpful. Um, I've also heard that Code Academy is good, and I think somebody just recommended something here um, about this YouTube channel. They put another playlist up for Kids Can Code. Um, Geeks for Geeks has a ton of examples. So there are all kind. Oh, yeah, W3 Python is also extremely good. Peter is very correct. I use W3 oftentimes when um, I'm when I'm going through and showing people how to search for Google stuff. Um, so there are places to look, and I would start by looking at tutoring and look online and. Um, so I don't think you're in one of my classes. What I tell my students is always reach out to me before you get frustrated. I can't answer for what another professor does, but if you're in my class and you're frustrated, send me your code or send me a screen capture of your Zybooks, and I will do my best to kind of point you in the right direction. So does anybody have any other questions? No, it's not on GitHub, Harold. I, put, I, I basically put them up on a Google Drive, and I provide links to them in the description of the YouTube video. Um, I don't think you can make me as your teacher. Um, I don't think they allowed you allow you to switch, but thank you very much for the compliment, Peter. Um, if nobody has any other questions, I'm going to call it for tonight. And, okay, I have a problem. All right, so what problem do you have um, with PyCharm when you save the file? What is it doing? And, by the way, people don't have to stay around if you don't want to hear. Um, what do you mean by it won't read it correctly? You can also unmute and we can talk. Yes, like, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. 
So, so when I run it through the console, it works. But then when I save it and try to run it through the file, it doesn't work. You mean through Zybox? No, I mean just to open the the file directly. Okay, so you're gonna you've got a .py file and you're trying to open that .py file, and you are you expecting it to run? It, it runs like the first two lines and then it stops. Okay. You want to so, run are you getting any errors? Are you getting any syntax errors? No, it just exits out. It just exits out. Okay, I would need to look at your code to know why it's doing that. Do you have a specific challenge that you're looking at? Oh, is that uh, just like the, the easy one, name age? Min age? Yeah, name is that, age. Yeah. Um, is that in Zybooks? No, that was, uh, we had to create it on the pie chart and then just send Oh, it. This, is the, this is the assignment? Yes. Okay. So... It's exiting, uh, um, I want to give too much away, so I'm trying to say. So the first line, of, so you're getting input, right? You're using things like input? Yes, so when I run it through the pie charm, it works perfectly. Okay. And then, and then I save it, and when I get to the file, it won't, like, it will run just one line and then stops. So are you trying to run it outside of PyCharm? Correct. You don't need to. Uh, because I was like double checking myself. Uh, okay. and then... You don't need to. If it runs inside of PyCharm, that's the only requirement that you have. If you want to try and run it through the interpreter, you can on the command line, but you don't have to. Okay, so that's... I thought that I was saving it in there. Uh... Wrong folder or wrong... PyCharm saves the file itself. You don't have to actually save anything. And the way you find out where PyCharm has saved it is you go to the tab, and then you right-click, and I'm on a Mac, so it says Reveal in yeah. Finder, but it'll probably say, like, Show in Folder. And it's open in Explorer, yeah. Open in Explorer, and then it will take you directly to the folder where it has saved the file. There's no specific save for PyCharm, which is confusing to a lot of students because, you know, we hit save okay. when we're writing a Word document or doing just about anything. PyCharm doesn't require you to save. It just automatically writes it to the file. There is no buffer. It's working directly against the file. I see. So you don't have to save it, and if it runs in PyCharm, then you just go to where it is in the folder, and then that's what you're going to upload for your assignment. Right. Because I already uploaded the, I I, I copied and pasted it as well, just in case. Okay. You know, did you upload the py file? I did. Okay. So you're probably fine then. Um. As long as the py file ran in PyCharm, there's no requirement that it runs externally in the interpreter. Okay. Thank you so and much. No problem. Glad to be of some help. Can I answer any questions for anybody else? Going once. Going twice. Everybody have a wonderful evening, and I will hopefully have this up tomorrow. Good night.